Okay. Very warm welcome to everybody here for a second edition of the uh, Mathematics Education Seminar. It's my uh, pleasure to welcome Alexander and Meyer Schuler here. Schuler Meyer, sorry. Yeah, it's <laughs> Schuler Meyer here uh, as our Schuler, uh, second uh, speaker. And, um, well, our aim is to bring people together who are interested in mathematics education, people from different institutions. I see the my own institution has a good uh, delegation here, but there's also someone from the social department, I mean educational department, social science, <laughs> and uh, someone from what's your institute? Uh, I'm from the Netherlands Institute for Curriculum Development. There you go, so it's very nice to have yes. you here today. Please. Well, it's great that you can be here today. And it's very great that you can be here today, Alexander. So for those who do not know him, uh, Alexander, uh, well, he started um, his uh, PhD at the University of Oldenburg. And while he did that, uh, he uh, continued also for a small part uh, to teach at secondary school. His, um, uh, he, he was working on algebraic thinking, transition, so transitioning students' practice, practices of defining, am I? Yeah, yeah. yeah that was in Dortmund already, yeah. And uh, then, oh, that was in Dortmund, so yeah, after yeah. that he continued yeah. as a postdoc in Dortmund, where I worked with Susanne Prediger, and that's uh, his subject there yeah. was on language issues, which yeah. will be a uh, subject of this part of this talk. And on your website you say um, that the wide variety of students <laughs> thinking about <laughs> mathematics surprised me again and again. Yeah. Uh, so we're very interested in what the surprises contain and yeah. uh, well we hope you can surprise us today with your I hope so <laughs> yeah thank you for the nice introduction uh, yeah so um, thank you for the nice invitation and thank you that I can be here today um, I will talk about um, a project that happened at TU Dortmund University when I was a postdoc there so that was kind of only one year ago because I'm here for one year in Eindhoven. And before that, I was in Dortmund. And a bit of background about me. I have kind of two interests. So the one interest is multilingual mathematics learning. You see here a Turkish worksheet. Um, you don't need to be able to read it. I cannot read it myself. Um, the other part is learning mathematics in transition to university. That's my other interest. Yeah, and then on a private note, well, I'm here for a year now, and I'm learning Dutch, and uh, yeah, so that's my private life. But I was asked to, to tell something about discursive perspectives in mathematics learning, and both of these research interests for me are kind of concerned with language and mathematics or mathematical discourses. Today I will tell about this one. So why bilingualism in mathematics, you could ask? That's for the German side. There is a statistic that says that cities with a population of 100,000 inhabitants or higher have at least a population of 50% multilingual students in school right now. And I, I, for fun, I took a map and found all the, the uh, cities that were mentioned in this, this statistic. And you see here, this is Dortmund where I worked beforehand and you see all these red dots that are not even representing all the dots that there should be, but there was no room for making more dots because the rural area is really densely populated. And that's the traditional area where immigration happened in Germany. And so in Germany we have last large populations of immigrants from Turkey or Arab countries. Um, and this statistic is probably also wrong because it captures only first generation immigrants. So there are also a higher number likely of students, children speaking multiple languages where the parents immigrated or the grandparents immigrated to Germany. And normally, or oh, that's the typical case, is that languages survive over the generations. So especially, for example, in Turkish families, language is really part of the identity. So even third generation students speak at home, they speak Turkish with their parents. So 
it's really part of the identity and it's really a language that is surviving. Um, some schools offer something like, okay, this is a Turkish course. What this means is, well, it's like kind of geography education where students learn about Turkey and, and well, where they come from and that's usually taught by a, a teacher who comes from Turkey and okay, it's not about language but it's about identity building. But only very few schools do that. So that's the situation. Um, but this is also the situation. There's a huge achievement gap that says that multilingual students are usually less proficient than their monolingual peers in mathematics and STEM in general. And it was found that this has to do with the language of instruction. So with German or with a lower proficiency, whatever that means in the German language. So that's what I will talk about today. And this is really the innovative part. We designed a bilingual teaching intervention in mathematics. So, how do you start with bilingual learning in mathematics? Well, first bit of background from mathematics education research. Well, first the question, Kandia Morgan asked, okay, who is not multilingual now? today in, in well, a global world. I, I guess over 90% of Dutch people claim that they are bilingual English-Dutch. And for most people I meet, that actually is true. So all people I talk to switch to English when I try to talk in Dutch with them. So it's, it's very nice. So that, that's, that's really the question who is not multilingual now. Um, and there are case studies um, that indicate that, that multilinguality or activating multiple languages can be really a benefit for mathematics learning. For example, for rich, rich discourse practices that you have well, more means to talk about mathematics, that you have more means to negotiate meaning of mathematical language. So for example, what is vierkant? Uh, in uh, Dutch, English, and, and German, um, and also for rich mathematical discussions, if they are rooted in everyday experiences. I will talk a bit more about that later. There is no quantitative evidence about the efficacy. So we don't know if there are actually learning gains if you teach mathematics multilingual in a multilingual way. So the question is, can multilingual mathematics learning help to close the achievement gap that's there uh, for multilingual learners? And by how to do that? Well, by building on these resources <coughs> to help students achieve higher learning outcomes. That would be the idea. Well, <coughs> of course, we know a lot of about resources, but the whole discourse about multilingual mathematics learning started out in the 90s and 80s and 90s as, well, there are students who have huge difficulties with mathematics because of the language that started in America with uh, black students and Latin American students, where it was identified, okay, these students really struggle. And of course, South African context <laughs> also. So it's started out in these areas. And there the problem, one problem, one obstacle for, for really doing bilingual mathematics education is that language has to do with power. In Germany, language is, uh, is, is uh, German is really the language to get access to education, everybody. So it is considered that you need to talk German to get a good job. Um, you have to be really fluent in German, so if someone notices that your German is not good, that is really um, might not be so good in a job interview, for example. So it is really the language of power to get access to every resources and, and good income and a good job, and it's really, and that's in other countries as well. South Africa is even stronger, where schools teach in English because the students themselves say, I need to speak English to have a chance in life.
but I, I told about uh, the uh, Turkish students who talk um, at home in Turkish. But what they are not learning at home when they are um, talking in Turkish is that there's a formal academic register. They are not learning about that very much because, well, they don't talk about homework in Turkish. Usually that's the point where, where, where the family switches to German or to another language, to, to the main language where they live in, because if you talk about bureaucracy, then you do that in the other language. You talk in German about the bad teacher or, or the, the difficult homework. And it's easy to see. How do you say 24 divided by 6 in German or 4 fifths? How do you say that in, in Turkish? Uh, the students learn that in German. And how do you say that in Turkish? Also, there is a time on task argument. So if you do, it is said that if you do bilingual mathematics learning, you have to invest time in, in the language part of learning. And that is time you cannot spend on doing mathematics. So this is the time on task argument. Less time to actually engage with mathematics. And there are institutional, effective, and linguistic problems. A funny story when we had our teaching intervention one teacher came in and was really looking weird at our teacher who was uh, speaking Turkish in that moment and asking, what are you doing there? So it's really like something you cannot do in a German school to really speak Turkish. That, that's kind of everybody looks on it and is kind of confused. And a lot of schools say it is not allowed to speak another language other than German in school at all. At no point can you speak another language. So, the design part. So, in order to address this question, can students really benefit from bilingual learning in that case? Um, we had to design a teaching intervention. And one starting point, one central starting point for that was um, the idea, what are languages in our head? So, traditionally, it was said that multilingualism means that, that well, in my head there are two areas in my brain, one is for English, the other one is for German, and a really small area for Dutch, and they are all disconnected and on different levels of proficiency. Today, it is more <coughs> said that there is something like translanguages, translanguaging, and what does it mean? It means that, that language practices are fluid practices that go between and beyond socially constructed language and educational systems, structures and practices to engage diverse students, multiple meaning making systems and subjectivities. That means it's not separate languages, but I can constantly connect my languages also while speaking um, to form a sentence and to speak. So for example, what happens a lot to me is that I speak in English, but my grammar is German. So you might notice that, that while I'm using English words, my grammar might be off, and that might be because well, I'm translanguaging in my head, I'm using grammar from Germany. And for mathematics, that means it might be possible that one can move uh, fluently between languages to make meaning. So it might be that in one language, I, I can think better about fractions than in another language, and that <coughs> by, by switching that, I have two perspectives on the same concept. The second part of the theoretical framework was uh, the idea of connecting registers. That, of course, you all know Duval, that in, in mathematics you always need <coughs> to connect representations in order to, to make meaning in mathematics. And that is the extension of this idea towards two languages. So then, if we are in a bilingual content, you have the L2, the first language, and you have the uh, um, L1, the first language, and L2, the second language, whatever that is. It can be English, Turkish, it can be L3, because it doesn't need to be bilingual. But it is connected to the concrete materials, to, to graphical representations, or to symbolic numerical registers, um, yeah, symbolic expressions. And, all, and between that, it's, it's talk about all these things. And the theoretical idea is that everything needs to be connected at all points 
to, for our students to make meaning. So this is the idea of changing and relating registers. For the design, we started out with a German intervention that was addressed at um, students who were weak with their language, but it was a monolingual intervention. So we started out, okay, this is a, a monolingual intervention for, for students who struggle with language, and this was the design of this course. It was, of course, this, this relating registers. You can see here graphical representation, symbolic representation. You don't need to read it. But that's the idea to connect everything and to have everyday contexts. From where on you <coughs> develop through scaffolding um, that you develop the, the formal mathematics. <coughs> and the formal mathematics in this case also means the, the academic technical language you need to speak about this piece of <coughs> mathematics. And the idea was, okay, language, students who struggle with language, if you make language explicit and uh, offer something where language becomes a learning, element of learning, then it's beneficial. From there on, we developed the bilingual intervention. We decided for Turkish and German. And we started with <coughs> similar everyday context, but we started with a context that might be familiar from the students in, in their Turkish everyday life. And then through bilingual translanguaging scaffolding. So the teacher scaffolding um, both languages and the use of both languages towards also academic and mathematical technical German language. So while we said, okay, we start with bilingual learning, the aim has to be to develop the German mathematical understanding so that these students well, can do better in the regular mathematics classroom, which is in German. So the trajectory was from bilingual uh, learning environment towards making language choices open to the students towards German. The material we gave to the students was in both languages, so in Turkish and German. And one student had a Turkish material, the other student had German material, and then students could compare, okay, what do you have, uh, what do I have, so that, that students who struggle with this language can compare and see, okay, what does it mean in the other language? The reflection of languages was also a part. When I read three to aim, uh, now I'm, <laughs> it's Turkish, so it's like someone who, yeah, three to one, that's, that's Turkish, and then I take three there in one. That's a literal translation of the Turkish phrase. And now it's translated into English. It was German before, so it's really a mix of language. Um, three there in one. And you might notice that, that this Turkish conceptualization is the whole, and there, from the whole, I take a part. And that's part of the whole understanding of fraction. That's really like a good way of, of talking about fractions. If you say the whole part first, and then, okay, I take from three pieces, I take one. That makes total sense. In Germany, we say uh, one third, and that is kind of the part first and then the whole afterwards. And then, of course, practices of linking Turkish and German, where the teacher tried to link words and phrases uh, from Turkish and German together um, and, and worked with what the students were offer offering in terms of language. So if the students were, for example, saying something really informal, the teacher tried to formalize it and, and rephrase it and give it back to the students. How does it look like? Well, this is an example. The first task, the second task uh, in, um, this was the first task, the second task of the first intervention session, um, where you can see, okay, language is connected to graphical representation, is connected to symbolic representations. And it is about sharing a well, chocolate bar. And this is what started the discussion about fractions for these students. F 
the first question we had about the efficacy. So, <coughs> given the specific context and obstacles that I talked about, is there really a benefit or is there a disadvantage for students um, in participating in a bilingual mathematics course compared to a corresponding monolingual course? And depending on the student's language proficiency, will that affect uh, how good they learn in the intervention? So is a student who has a weak Turkish proficiency really at a disadvantage in such a course? Or does it matter at all? And second question, how do students use their multiple languages for meaning making? Is the assumption really true that two languages provide two different perspectives on the same content so that it's beneficial for learning? Okay, we tackled this question in an intervention study. So we started out with an initial sample of 1,124 students in grade 7. And, well, we had a test for their immigration status, for their intelligence. We tested them for their language proficiency in Turkish and German. And, of course, we tested them for their um, proficiency in mathematics um, with C tests. So ask if you want to know more about that one. And we had the pretest on conceptual understanding of fractions. And you see here, 254 of these 1,124 students were multilingual German-Turkish. There were other multilingual students with Russia, Russian languages and Arabic languages. Okay, they didn't matter. We just were interested in the Turkish students. Based on that, we selected students with uh, high Turkish proficiency and a low Turkish proficiency with a low mathematical achievement. So these students already learned about fractions. And so uh, with the test, um, we figured out, OK, how well did they learn fractions? And if they didn't learn fractions very well, we said, OK, we have an intervention to offer where you can really relearn fractions. From there on, we built three groups, a monolingual group, a bilingual group, and a control group. and had an intervention with these students for five times 90 minutes, over five weeks. Afterwards, we did a post-test on fractions. We did, of course, a follow-up test on fractions. And we videotaped everything. So we have the students' written products, and we have the, the videos of all intervention groups. Um, so one group usually with four students. So these were 11 groups. These were 12 groups or so, and from all these groups over five weeks, we have the videotapes. So it's really, I don't know, a lot of data. So again, five sessions with 90 minutes over a period of five weeks. And the intervention was implemented by trained teacher students who were proficient in Turkish and German. And the intervention was implemented in 12 schools in the rural area I talked about. One of these schools dropped out. That was the Turkish school. That is another story. Um, yeah, as I said, the students had a low score in their conceptual understanding of fractions. And the intervention happened next to the regular mathematics classroom. So additionally. It was about, OK, I said that, about uh, facilitating seventh graders' conceptual understanding of fractions with groups of about two to four students. And we looked qualitatively uh, for learning processes, so the effects of the intervention, but also we looked at the efficacy, so the, learner, the learning gains in the end. First, I talk about the efficacy, about the learning gains. So was your intervention successful in terms of learning gains? <coughs> First, we, we were successful in establishing a bilingual classroom discourse. So that's the first question you ask. Well, if you have a bilingual intervention, was there a bilingual talk? Did they actually do something 
in, by, by talking in Turkish and German. And you see here, so from the third session, we uh, categorized all the material from the third session um, from all the groups to figure out, okay, how long was everybody talking in what language? The teacher of, of this time, the teacher was talking 12.3%, the students 11.8%, and then there is a mixed language use where you cannot really say which language is spoken because the, everybody is switching so fast between Turkish and German, just inserting one word from that language, and then it's really a mix that you cannot really, where our students' assistants who coded the material said, it's not possible to say which language is spoken at that moment in that time. So they said, okay, this is mixed language. So that's really, that's the minimum. So this is second based. So they coded second per second. So it's really, and then there were seconds which you cannot really code in another way. And this is this part. And that's really impressive. Um, so the students talked in Turkish. And that's remarkable in itself because they have never spoken Turkish in a classroom in school or in mathematics. We asked them specifically, have you learned with your older brother, have you learned mathematics in, in Turkish? Have you spoken uh, about mathematics in Turkish? They all said no. And so it's remarkable that they did in our intervention. And this is kind of, we, we said, this is kind of also Turkish because there are Turkish elements in there. And so it's, if, if you count all this together, it's 45%. Turkish youth. So the intervention was successful in establishing a bilingual classroom discourse. Um, and that's really, <coughs> yeah, that's really something. We can discuss this other amount. That's for later. So Students learned in a bilingual mode. So now we had the following hypothesis. The first uh, hypothesis is uh, that the bilingual intervention is less effective for the conceptual understanding. And that's because we assume that the time for, for acquiring proficiency in the Turkish academic technical register reduces the time on task. So this is a time on task argument. If you spend time in, in talking bilingually and to talk about language, you have less time for doing mathematics. And that's why we assumed this one. And we assume that students with a low uh, Turkish language proficiency will benefit less from the bilingual intervention. Because these students have to overcome more barriers, obstacles to talk in Turkish. So, the orange one is the monolingual intervention. This is pre, post, and follow up test in the control group. And you see in the post test, really, the, the monolingual intervention was, this is not, was a bit better. It looks better, but it was not statistically significant. So, um, the statistic is saying that both groups learned equally well. And also here you fi find no statistic uh, significant difference between the groups in the uh, follow-up test. So what we found is that both interventions show a significant increase in the uh, learning gains compared to the control group and with very high effect sizes. Oh, it's a very high effect size. And uh, oh, there's an arrow in there. Mono and bilingual intervention have comparable effects on students' learning. So what about the low and high language proficiency in Turkish? So this is the students who have a high Turkish language proficiency, both in the monolingual intervention and the bilingual intervention. And you see, yeah, well, yeah, a bit higher. And these are the students with a low Turkish language proficiency. And indeed, the statistic is saying that learners with a high Turkish language proficiency benefit more from the bilingual intervention than the low proficient students. <coughs> so we assumed or we, we asked ourselves whether there is a threshold level where you can really say, okay, 
students have to have this proficiency to really engage in a bilingual learning environment um, in order to, to benefit from it in terms of conceptual understanding. But we don't know. Okay. So, the first one was rejected. Um, both are equally effective. So monolingual and bilingual intervention are equally effective. But this is confirmed. And yeah, but this is also a f and something you have often with intervention studies that the learners who are already better than the other students will benefit more from an intervention than the students who are already weak. So this effect, we know about this effect and we might have this effect here as well. So first, intermezzo, what can we learn from this? Well, it's a strong support because it's the first evidence that it's really beneficial for learning. So it's a strong support for implementing bilingual mathematics learning, if you will, into the mathematics classroom. But then you can immediately ask, OK, how? So do you want to have like a bilingual education at the whole classroom level? How can you even do that? Because like, you cannot have a classroom with <coughs> Turkish, uh, German-speaking bilingual students. I mean, that, that's kind of yeah, unethical even, if you <laughs> make classrooms in this way. At the group level, you can say, OK, is it sensible to have a group in, in a classroom? Uh, this, this group is speaking um, Turkish-German to talk about a ta task. Yes, it's equally. We can imagine students doing that when they work on a specific task. <coughs> we could also imagine that, that, okay, we can say students can talk in whatever language they prefer about mathematics, but we don't know what happens then. <coughs> so what are really hindering factors that prevent low proficient students from benefiting from the bilingual intervention? Now for this, this effect that bilingual uh, low proficient learners learn less. So what's really happening there. So is it that, that low proficient students cannot really follow the conversations that happen in the classroom, the mathematical conversations, or does it require a high cognitive effort, effort to, to follow bilingual conversations about mathematics um, leading to cognitive load or something? Or is it really that students lack the proficiency in the academic register, so the formal language to really that they can engage with the mathematics? That's, these are open questions. We don't know. So now a qualitative look at the learning processes. What does it really mean to use multiple languages as, as a resource? I, I, in the beginning, I talked about, OK, yeah, multilinguality can be a resource for mathematics learning. Um, and I showed you this task where it really where the, the idea of connecting registers where this is happening. But for conceptual insights, we stumbled upon something that, that was really interesting. And because we didn't anticipate that. So there's a really a real difference between how fractions are conceptualized in German and how they are conceptualized in Turkish. So in German and also in Dutch, you say um, one-fifths or three-fifths. Drei-fünftel, three-fifths. So you have, you talk first about the parts, and you kind of have a quasi-cardinal notion. OK, this is like one, two, three. These are three pieces from a whole from five. But the way it is drawn already implicates, OK, students can like <coughs> neglect the whole part and just look at, at the, the three. And then it's like uh, that's, they will have a non-viable notion of a fraction. Or the, the fraction as a share, three of five. That's kind of a bit different. But for Turkish, it's uh, interesting that, that it's a localizing way of saying it. Five, therein, three. So you say the whole first, and therein, so in there, like a container, you have three. 
or thereof, like taking. From a whole of five, I take three, and they belong to me. Perhaps you know other languages where that is the case as well. We only figured this out for Turkish. Um, but it's really interesting. And, and this one you could hypothesize that, that this is really better for understanding, because this is a part of a whole conceptual understanding of a fraction, which is in the literature, which is said to be better for understanding fractions. And also you could imagine that like from an everyday standpoint where you have like, okay, I have five pieces of candy, I want to share the pieces of candy, I take three pieces of candy out of these five and they belong to me. So this is a way of talking about fractions that could be really close to what the students are uh, experiencing in their everyday life. I want to zoom into the, the fourth uh, session of the intervention. So um, the fourth session out of five, where we wanted the students to relearn the procedure for calculating, well, five, six of 24, for example. And you see here a picture how we did that. So this is kind of a fraction bar board. So divided into six areas where it says uh, 0, 6, 1, 6, 2, 6, and this is really the part of a whole. So this represents uh, the part of a whole notion. And if you have 25, that, that's uh, well, a relative share. So you have the whole of 25 stones that you distribute equally on this fraction bar board. And then you have to take five out of these six pieces. And if you count the stones, then you arrive at your solution. So this is another way of looking at the fraction bar. And we gave students diff uh, fraction bars with different lengths. So this is a tool that students are supposed to choose. So if they are given a fraction like 5 sixths or 3 fourths, then they are supposed to choose which fraction bar fits to the task and then they draw like this well like the task is set up they draw this card and it shows them um, the, the fraction and they draw a number card this one and then they have kind of built their own task and then the students choose the appropriate fraction bar from those they are given and then they use stones to figure out, okay, what's the relative share? So how does it work? Now an easy example, if you have, um, oh, I don't know, so it's, uh, the whole is 12, and you have a fraction, one third, two third, one of those, uh, two third, okay. Uh, so the task is two third of 12, and then you distribute the stones that you have chosen on this fraction bar board. And it is supposed to result in a schematized procedure. So progressive schematization, where the first step is 12 divided by 3, where 3 is a denominator. And in the second step, um, you adding, add the result two times, or you multiply by 2. Um, and 2 is a numerator. And by that you arrive at a procedure and we anticipated, okay, by doing that uh, multiple times students will through progressive schematization figure out how this calculation works, how this procedure works. And then we gave them, them this, this protocol for writing down, okay, what did they do? This is a Turkish version, uh, where we give you the translation here, so where they kind of write down what they did in an um, structured way. So by doing this task multiple times and uh, documenting what they are doing, um, they kind of can, they are supposed to figure out how this procedure works. Behind that is the idea of progressive schematization. And it is a model for how students can reinvent procedures from realistic problems from their conceptual understanding. So the point is to provide uh, context and problems that are realistic 
but which back to be organized with the appropriate mathematics to be learned. So it, progressive schematization is a process in which students iteratively compactify, whatever that means, their concrete contextual actions, so their actions with these stones, in realistic context with the fraction bar board, into actions with symbols, so in a, into a procedure they can do as a calculation. In each step of, the, of, of compacting, the meaning of the symbolic action, so the calculation, the meaning of the calculation is supposed to come from the realistic context. So students need to continuously link the contextual meaning with the symbolic meaning. So if you imagine this as, okay, you have 12 pieces of candy, we are three people, how much candy is everybody getting? Um, okay. From there, you can develop the procedure. And the Redford provides the idea of, of, of objectification to really model what's going on in progressive schematization in three steps. He, Redford is calling that sem semiotic contraction. Contraction is a mechanism for reducing attention to those <coughs> aspects that appear to be relevant. In the semiotic system of language and gestures, contraction leads to a shorter statement having fewer and better articulated words, accompanied perhaps by short and more precise gestures. So it's really about reducing attention from a task that is overwhelming and has many facets to those facets of a task that really, or to those aspects that are really relevant for doing the calculation. And he's suggesting two stages, the factual level. And he says, the universe of discourse does not go beyond the particular task. It is a scheme operating on the particular example and not going beyond it. So the, 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 the current tasks that the students build themselves right now, they're looking at that and they, they cannot look beyond that because they do not have the means yet to do that. And they cannot really distinguish or pay attention to those aspects that are more relevant than others. So they are kind of overwhelmed by all aspects that are seemingly equally relevant. And that's... And then the contextual level. A contraction of previous activity with semiotic means. So symbols, gestures, spoken language. Um, so that choices can be made what counts as uh, relevant and irrelevant. And then, at a symbolic level, um, the activity is initiated and implemented on its own initiative, on relevant aspects of a task, if used at all, words and symbols are used in a contracted way. So this is really saying that you have difficulties observing what's going on because the students can do the calculation in their head. So two-thirds of twelve, we all can do it in our heads. And, and <laughs> that I do the calculation right now, you cannot see it because it's uh, on a symbolic level in my mind, and it's hard to observe. So, with this notion of objectification, to, to really have a model for what's going on in uh, schematization, um, you can have these three levels, but you can also like kind of figure out all the steps that students have to do to really do the procedure, to find a relative share. Some of these steps have more conceptual insight um, than others. So some are really realis uh, uh, ritualistic, that's the term from Swart, um, like drawing the share or drawing a number card um, or verbalizing a task that is not really, you could argue it's not mathematics, not necessarily, um, and that these are the conceptual steps that require insight from the student. So, in, in theory, a student has to go a trajectory kind of from factual doing these steps to, towards doing these steps in a symbolic mode over the course of multiple tasks. So, I already 
give a disclaimer here. There is this material activity with the stones and there is a formal procedure. And we might argue or we might discuss in the end that this remains disconnected. So I will show you why. And now, um, usually there would be one uh, person in the audience who would be able to speak Turkish. Um, someone voluntarily, okay. Um, so the translation comes afterwards. Um, I, I really, um, it's like, it has been a year, I cannot even, yeah, speak it anymore. Um, so how many Checky Deck stones are there? How many are we going to take? Six, twelve, six. How many Checky Deck are we going to take? Six, twelve in Turkish now. Um, the yellow card, the whole quantity card shows how many Checky Decks you took. So this is, this, uh, is the teacher speaking. So before this task, this is the second task. In the previous task, um, well, the students basically suggested all numbers that are in there. So the numerator, denominator, and the quantity, they all said, okay, we have to dis use this and this and this. Yes? Just very quick question, and yes. teacher's background, is he Turkish? Yes, Turkish? he speaks, uh, he and she, in this case it was he, uh, he is speaking Turkish, yes. He is proficient in Turkish and German. But native language is Turkish? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, you cannot really say he was born in Germany and he is equally proficient in both languages. Yeah. So what the students were like, they were not able to look beyond this task. So all numbers were equally relevant and they just set every number that is in the task and without any means to say which number is more relevant in that case. So the stu students were not able to um, assign relevance to the numbers beyond the particularities of this given task. This is what then Redford called the, the factual level. And that was in the first task. Now you see here the second task, and you see here the students are kind of doing the same again. They are changing between 6 and 12, um, and they cannot really assign which number is more relevant. Acacia and Halim can have kind of figure out, figured out um, what is relevant. So they stick, they have made a choice, and they stick to their choice. Um, but the other students kind of, of cannot really say and they stick with the six. Here, the way the teacher guides the student's attention is, um, as a rule, you have to look at the <coughs> whole quantity card. So look at the card you draw. This is the number that, that is the same as the number of Jackie deck you have to take. This is a kind of rule-based look at the card, choose the number of, of stones that is written on the card. And this kind of seems to work because in the following tasks, the students can do this step on their own. So they, to, to choose the number of stones that are relevant, the students from there on can do it. So this is factual level, where the students start out. Then they have the contextual level where they, the, the students can see what is relevant and then it's, it's like automated and it's symbolic. The students do that immediately upon seeing the task. In terms of language, you see here, okay, the question is in Turkish. The answer is in German from the students. And the teacher is asking again in Turkish and then the students switch to, lang to, to Turkish. And it might be that this is because they just feel if the teacher is asking the question again in Turkish, they are kind of expected to now give the answer in Turkish instead of German. It might be just a language pressure thing and not a mathematical thing in that instance. Second episode. And it's immediately afterwards, the third task. Acacia, the third part is four, isn't it? Ignore 16. Hmm. Hey, what now? 4 or 16? The sort part is 16. What is the sort part? The teacher asks again. 1 fourth. If we say 1 fourth, what is the sort part? How many parts do we search for? How many fields do we look at in Turkish? 4, dirt, 4, dirt, alana, bakarsak. If we look at 4 fields, the teacher asks, onalti, 16, 
8888. So again, a lot of numbers going on. Um, so in the previous task, students used the guessing strategy. But at the same time, Acacia, it's one of the better students, was able in the previous task to justify her result by, by arguing you have to have three fields on the um, fraction bar board and then you have to count on this one. Okay, that was beforehand. Now the students again have distributed the six stones, have distributed them on the fraction bar board evenly, and, but this material does not help them to identify or solve the task at this point. So they are still basically saying all numbers that are in this task. Denominator and the, the whole. So the teacher guides the student's attention that comes after this episode. Where do we see one out of four? And then the students are able to identify the relevant field and count its stones. So again, with the teacher guiding the student's attention, then, then uh, the students are able to do it. But this step is the most difficult step over all tasks. And it, it, it's kind of surprising that it is the same issue in all three following tasks. So this is the third task out of six, and in all three following tasks, the students still struggle and have basically the same discussion as here. So this is factual and contextual level. Now, if you look at the languages, again, it's German in the beginning, and then it's a switch to Turkish initiated by the teacher um, to, to guide the discussion of what is relevant here. And it might be that this Turkish question might provide additional meaning-making rules for Halim and Hakan. They both say four, but you cannot really decide whether it is this four or the, the, the answer. So. Uh, the result of the calculation one fourth of 16, or whether it's a it's, uh, uh, denominator. I cannot really say. It's open to interpretation. The overview of this whole process. So again, they are supposed to move to here, the students. What is happening here, this is drawing a card. Okay, this is not really interesting. The students can do that immediately, so after it has been discussed, this, this setup of the task works automatically. Choosing a number of stones. In the first three tasks, the teacher is guiding this process. In the fifth task and later, the students um, automate, uh, automatize this one. So first the students discuss it in the group, and then it's like after that, OK, that's said. Distributing the stones evenly. Um, this kind of emerges not as a conceptual understanding that it is a fraction bar board and that you have to distribute evenly to figure out a fraction, which has happened in the previous three intervention sessions, but it emerges out of a rhythmic addition thing. So by doing that over and over again, the, the meaning emerges out of, okay, we have to do it this way because we do it this way all the time, and not as a conceptual thing. and determining the relevant parts and the resulting number, so, so giving the answer basically, having the whole procedure, the last step. That's happening with teacher guidance. So up to fifth task and later, the students still have naive inductions to give the answer and have no clear conceptual idea why they are doing it the way they are doing it. So the teacher is guiding the student's attention and only Hakan from task five onward is, is, has figured out how it works and he is from the fifth task onward to on task five and six he can immediately give the answer when he sees the task. So he is on a symbolic level. Yeah, and the protocol, I, I showed that to you, filling out the protocol was, was uh, practice in itself, it was difficult in itself, the students struggled with that, so that's why I have like a column for that as well. In terms of language, language as a resource, that was the whole idea of this bilingual intervention. And 
language as a resource would pose that this whole activity would start out as sharing pieces of candy in everyday situations. That is where we started in the first intervention by having a piece of chocolate bar that you share between students. And I mean, this idea we expected that it would come up here as well, that this is the same as sharing candy or a piece of a friction, uh, or a piece of a chocolate bar. That was the assumption and that is where we assumed the resources would be from students. But this did not happen. And to improve this and, and what also did not happen, but with which I would say should happen is to explicitly discuss a connection between the informal context and, and the formal representation. So that this not, uh, it did not happen, so we cannot really say if it would have helped, if it had happened. But if the teacher would have discussed, okay, what does it mean what you are doing in terms of, of uh, f uh, um, sharing uh, candy or sharing a chocolate bar and connecting it to the actual uh, graphical representation, that this might have helped the students of that hypothesis. <coughs> and filling out the protocol was interesting also because it's kind of connected to the idea that it is a genre. If you give students a table to fill out, they immediately, well, try to fill out a table. And that's not necessarily something where they activate conceptual understanding, but which they might do in a procedural way. So by giving a, a protocol where the students are just supposed to fill out what they did beforehand, it became something like, okay, the symbolic representation is important and we can solve this task just on a symbolic level by filling out this table. And the table is everything that is relevant because we are given this table. Maybe, I don't know. That is for a later study to find that out. So, short summary. So the quantitative analysis really showed there are learning benefits. A bilingual intervention can really be beneficial for all students. Um, or what you can better say, it is at least not disturbing the learning process. So it's at least equally good as the monolingual intervention, if not better for the good students. So we looked at the processual effects, so language processing, and a lot of things happened there. From the teacher is uh, talking in Turkish to the students, so the uh, students switch to Turkish to answer in Turkish, towards using Turkish for really conceptual understanding, um, but also for identity building, for exercising agency, all this is happening as well if you activate multiple languages. But in terms of translingual, so connecting both languages to activate them both as meaning-making resources, this is something where I would say, okay, we really have to figure out, can we scaffold this better to really connect both languages to, to, to use for fractions, you can say, to activate the part of a whole notion or the other notion flexibly to make sense of a situation. Theoretical contribution is, of course, the local learning uh, uh, theory for bilingual learning. So, again, very fast. Okay, I already said that it is a resource for learning mathematics and this study showed that it is a resource also for concept development. We can show that it leads to higher learning gains. But the findings also show that we need to better understand how to scaffold translingual. So the idea that two languages provide two different ways of making meaning of the same mathematical object, if you will. And in terms of efficacy, conceptual, in terms of learning gains, um, the bilingual learning environment is at least not disturbing mathematics learning, but it is even beneficial. So at least nobody is getting lost. And bilingual mathematics courses provide students with opportunities for translingual practices, even so. 
and this way avoid language barriers in one language. We saw surprisingly few instances of that one because that was kind of the starting point. But these instances rely on that the connections are made explicit. And this is kind of the relating registers idea coming up again. So also in talk, in the explicit conversation, you have to connect everything. And what our PhD student Taha Kutsu showed is that two languages really offer two mutually supporting sources for meaning making in phases of consolidation. So not in, in the first contact situation with fractions, but after working through everything. And then in the consolidation moment, when students have both means to talk about fractions, this is beneficial for consolidation. Okay, limitations of a study, of course. Um, we had laboratory settings, we had ideal conditions where we uh, educated our teacher students to do bilingual teaching in mathematics. Um, and we focused on one language group of Turkish German speaking students. And what we found there might be specific for Turkish and the Turkish way of having two ways of denoting fractions. Uh, and of course we had our good teachers. So what comes next? The project is going on in Germany without me, kind of. Um, and now it's looking at how can you implement these findings in the regular classroom with teachers who are not bilingual Turkish German. So that, that's kind of the, the central question. If you want to implement such bilingual education in the regular classroom, <coughs> you usually have teachers who are not proficient in Turkish and German. They are, they are proficient in German, okay, and everything else you cannot really say something about. So to work in the whole classroom, you have to adapt this whole thing. And that's not as easy as it sounds on all levels. And also, um, we stumbled on that in the, this project as well, but that's even more in the follow-up project. Language is political. So would it even be possible to allow for multiple languages um, in the classroom next to the national language? So next to German, or if you would go for the Dutch classroom, or in Sweden this is a problem as well, if you have next to Swedish, Dutch, German, next to that if you have additional languages, can you activate them? Or would you get a call from the parents saying, why is, my, is a group of students speaking Turkish in the classroom? I don't want that. That's actually... I got a call like that from a whole school. Um, and for the Dutch context, and I tried to find numbers, but help me out, I, this is not really a good source for it. So, but this is supposed to represent the number of immigrants, and it's also the problem with statistics, it captures only first generation immigration, but not second, third, or fourth generation <coughs> immigration. And, well, Eindhoven, it's not so much. Eindhoven has more experts, international experts, <coughs> with an academic background like me, than uh, like weak language proficient students. But the start find on device, 2019. Quote, less positive is that the performance of pupils with a non-Western migration background Pupils with lower educated parents and often also boys lag behind in their learning outcomes. And on the next page, students with Western migration backgrounds, so if I had children, they are not a problem, they are as successful as their peers. But a note of this positive outcome is that pupils with a non-Western migration background still uh, fail their final exams more often than pupils with a uh, without a migrant background. So this is basically, um, yeah, this is the same numbers or the same starting situation than in Germany. Without, uh, I didn't find any study which attributes this to language difficulties. So this is like kind of, okay, I can quote this, but I have no idea if it's related to language in the Netherlands. 
So, let's do it. Should be done. Okay. Questions? Time for questions and yeah. discussion, and we'll, we'll use the microphone for that actually discussion. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. Except so. for you because you, you already have the microphone. <laughs> Anyone has a question or discussion point? Yeah. Let's start from the questions mostly, yeah. and then. Thank you very much, Alexander. Very in interesting. Uh, I would like to hear more about, uh, has, have the student teachers uh, reflected with the students on the differences of fractions in German and Turkish? Are there any examples yeah. of this? Yeah. So um, we have this task um, uh, uh, where they actually reflect on it. So in, in at least one task in every session is like where the, the reflection is, is, is going about. Okay. In Turkish, it's conceptualized this way. What does it really mean? And what's the difference to German? So there are these reflection tasks. So, um, and also in the, the we had uh, knowledge storage where the students documented by themselves what they have learned for each uh, session. And then they also document differences in Turkish and German and how you speak about fractions and what does it mean in an everyday situation. So, um, yes, we had that. More of questions? I had a question about the quantitative the efficacy mm -hmm. analysis yeah. that you did. So yeah. when I looked at the control group, mm -hmm. I was quite surprised about its patterns, particularly at the follow-up where they sort of seem to be together. Mm. Let me see. Delayed uh, post delayed. test or the <laughs> follow up test. <laughs> okay, um, I have to start the presentation again. Uh, this one. Yes. So, uh, about the control group, can you say the question again? So, when you have the, um, how do you call it, the, the follow up? Yeah. 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 So at that third time point, mm -hmm. all, all the three groups mm -hmm. are together. Yeah. So I wonder if you could explain like the trajectory of the mainly the control group. We have no idea. I mean, um, there is this phenomenon that's documented in the literature that if you give material to a school, that after the intervention, other teachers adopt this material, but. We try to prevent that. We have really no idea why this effect is there. We don't really know. Were the tasks in, the Were the tasks in pre test, post test, and follow up similar? Yes. So could they task per this themselves to be yeah. an intervention? Yeah, it could be a learning effect of, of the test itself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I thought uh, the example of where the meaning and the way mm. it's phrased yeah. uh, the yeah. fraction is so yeah. important for the yeah. understanding. Yeah. Uh, very interesting. And I yeah. was wondering, uh, did you think of more examples, also different languages, uh, any sort of cases where this happens? Because um, this one? Yeah. The, the yeah, so the, the way of the talking and conceptualizing yeah. where it's like... They're in three and Yes. Are there similar things in geometry or in algebra? Or I'm just curious about this phenomenon. Yeah. Um, so in uh, for um, basic, so elementary school for, for basic calculations in arithmetic, like addition and subtraction in, in first grade, the Chinese language seems to be better for students because this language conceptualizes calculations um, in a way that, that better reflects the, 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 the number system. Place so, value. place value, yeah, yes. In English, you have 89, yeah. or let's say 92, that's a better yeah. In German, it's zwei and neun, yeah. in French, it's got yeah. the yeah. So yeah. 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 Yeah.
So from my own observation is uh, now in the Dutch context that I also Dutch numbers, I tend to, to confuse the number system in Dutch when I talk in Dutch. So that its place value breaks. If you are in another language, it becomes more difficult again. That's kind of crazy, but that's just my own observation about myself. Yeah. But for others, I don't know. So for algebra, for example, I don't know. Yeah, thank you also uh, for the nice, clear presentation. Uh, I, I know of a study with uh, immigrants that in mathematics that uh, what, what might happen is that too easy the students and the teacher think of each other that they are talking about the same thing yeah. but that they misunderstand each yeah. other yeah. and so really important is this uh, schematization mm -hmm. but and the examples you showed I mm -hmm. didn't see real problems and I didn't see real schematizations by mm -hmm. the students so mm -hmm. yeah is that uh, well didn't you select them or so did they really schematize themselves also mm. to be able to talk about what's mm. going on there here it seemed mm. as if they had to use things that were given to them and then well you run the risk that they are using it well try yes. to use it but don't really yes. understand yes. how and why yes. um, so we expected or by designing this progressive schematization task um, we assumed that the students would connect everyday situation from the first intervention session and they, they kind of permeate everything. So this sharing of a chocolate bar permeates everything and pops up time and time again. So, um, and we expect that the fraction bar board, which resembles this, this bar where you distribute the stones, this is basically the same representation. So we expected that they would also connect fraction bar and this, this uh, yeah, fraction bar that we introduced in the first session for the Duplo. So Duplo is a fraction bar kind of, and that they would, or well, this, this meaning that it would uh, be activated in this progressive schematization as the starting point of like the start with conceptual understanding and then schematize from there. It didn't work that way. So I selected the, the, the good group. So I, I looked at all uh, 11 groups um, in search, f so our focus groups in search for, okay, where are the, the steps of schematization and where is the conceptual understanding that feeds into the procedure. And this is really difficult to find. So I, I would say to the point where it did not happen as we expected it to happen. So um, that, that these, these naive inductions that the students use in this task, it was really surprising and we didn't anticipate it. And uh, it's uh, to the point where we say, okay, the activity with distributing stones might not have been successful in this way. There were, of course, follow-up tasks for formalizing it further and, and discussing what happened beforehand and where they analyzed their protocol that they wrote. And in there, some students had the, like the, the moment where they ah, this is what it means. And then in the protocol, by analyzing that, they, they start to understand what's going on. But <laughs> the potential of the task is really not as expected. Um, I'm, I want to follow up on, on that mm -hmm. a little bit because to me it also seems a little bit confusing maybe also for students, if mm -hmm. it's for me it's probably mm -hmm. also for students, mm -hmm. that you have those things. Mm -hmm. The stones to distribute? Yeah, yeah. stones like they are uh, uh, countable mm -hmm. things, yeah. countable stones. Mm -hmm. And at the same time you have those fields mm -hmm. and at the third thing you have those fractions that are not connected to the field but to the lines in between the fields mm -hmm. and yes. it seems it seems yes. confusing yes. I, although I have no yes. real clear explanation but yes. those three things connected yeah. and also that you start with dividing 12 by 6 mm. but you don't you have 3 6 of 12 so mm. so I think it's too much um, too much mm. different things you have to make sense of, mm. which hinders to, to connect them together. But I don't um, know whether you have the same experience. 
So um, the initial idea is that, that really the, the calculation part is not really relevant in the beginning, but that the, the fraction bar and distributing stones and choosing stones and distributing them evenly, that's the whole idea of what a fraction is, that you have like equal sized shares of a whole. And this is the same idea now where the whole is like 24. That's a new whole kind of. Um, Yes, but you, you have to start somewhere. So uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's like, um, this, this is to make the difference between the, the Duplo context, the chocolate bar, where you have like this chocolate bar is clearly one piece, mm -hmm. one whole. Mm -hmm. And now you have to have it for a relative share. You have to have it like, you have to have 24 stones. It's, it's no way around it. You have to have them. And you have to understand that this is a new whole that you can treat as if it is a whole. And this is something that needs to be understood by the students. So there's no way around it. So this complexity has to be there from a mathematical standpoint. But I would say that, for example, um, we could have uh, gone back to everyday situation and like giving them 24 uh, pieces of candy and now um, have four students. And now um, how many pieces of candy is everyone getting? Then you miss the fraction. Yes, this is why we did not do it. But uh, if you want to connect to the everyday situation, I mean, these students would be perfectly able to, with, with 24 pieces yeah. of candy, to each have six pieces of candy when they have a group of four. And then they would say, OK, how many pieces of candies do two persons have in this group? Yeah, 12, of course. <laughs> so this is very intuitive. and. There might have been a trajectory where you can start with that and develop the formal notion of fractions from there. But we said, well, we introduced the fraction bar as the graphical representation already. So we wanted them to, to start not again with the everyday, but start with the tools they already have, the fraction bar. And this is why we started with this setup. Because we didn't want to go back to the everyday situation. We have been there. We discussed it. And we, we developed from there to the, the formal understanding and comparing the size of fractions. So we all did that. And we worked with the fraction bars. And students had a good understanding of that in the third session. Now we wanted to build on that. But perhaps it's an issue of complexity. I don't know. I would argue it is a thing of missed opportunities for connecting everything that has already been there. Yeah. For investing the time, okay, what does it mean in terms of what we already know? Can you say what, what this yellow fraction bar board has to do with the fraction bar from session three? Can you explain if it's the same or is it something different? And then the students say, well, it's basically the same. And then perhaps it has to be explicit and not assuming that it's activated automatically. No, okay. no, because um, so progressive schematization would say it's the factual, like the, ac the actions with, with some material are beneficial, like this, this actual um, distributing the stones evenly. And this is something that worked out really well. So this distributing part um, worked really well with the stones. So these material activities, we wanted to have them in there. But uh, yeah, I will go once more. Uh, yeah. Would you? Uh, from what have been discussed now, mm -hmm. I'm now thinking that concrete activity with concrete materials mm -hmm. and then for well more formalized, mm -hmm. uh, still visual mm -hmm. uh, activity will worry about different actions mm -hmm. and about actually different units. At mm -hmm. first, unit were the hole, then mm -hmm. units were the stones, so that mm -hmm. was a very different yes. thing. Yes, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. yes. And yeah, if you want to phrase it like that, the change of the unit is one of the difficulties. And as I said, you could go back to everyday situation to, to distribute candy, to, to change the unit in the beginning. Or the other way around. Or the other to way around. To make a, with a whole unit a formalized yeah. activity. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, a factual question. Mm -hmm. What language were the best? Only in German, German. or could they choose? No, German. Okay. And we, are, we were aware that this is problematic. But at the same time, we said, well, 
the idea is if we have this intervention, they should benefit from it in the regular German classroom. So if we test them in German, we would actually see how they benefit from everything they did in the German language. But that could be a problem, yes. Yes. We had an item in there that was uh, in a Turkish language, and this item was a mess. It didn't show anything. I wanted to follow up on this discussion for the task with mm -hmm. the chocolate bars mm -hmm. and yeah. the, yeah. the, the marbles, let's yeah. say. So I wonder, like, the, the chocolate bar, if I partition it in two, they, I have, yeah. like, two containers, right? And yeah. then I can put the marbles in. Yeah. And I wonder if I would put the stones all in one row. It would yeah. mimic the shape of that chocolate bar, so they yeah. have the same sort of actions what they do on the mm -hmm. stones, right? If they mm -hmm cut it in half or to mm. cut it in yeah. three parts because now they're mm. sort of groups mm. they don't really fit in a mm. chocolate bar or something yeah. Uh, yeah. the visuals are very different yeah. as well because yeah. um. for the chocolate parts it's length right? yeah. So yeah. Cut it in half. So the, but the visualization was also the, the length kind of and it, was, um, it represents one hole, so we assume that it was representing one hole if they have this fraction bar. And visually, it is one hole, so the yellow frame suggests, okay, this is still one hole, that you have 24 stones that you distribute, it shouldn't matter to you, so that kind of was the idea. But, um, but then again, mm, I think this it is not fundamentally different if you share a chocolate bar between four friends or if you share 24 sweets among four friends. So the still, the distribution part is still the same. You could kind of do the cutting action for a, a, a pile of candy and say, okay, this is half and this is half and then again half. This is the same action. It would be... The from action itself is very different because I have a group of stones yeah. and then I have to cut it in four, like chop it like that, for example. Or if I have a chocolate bar, I do this, which looks much more like your fraction bar, yeah. right? But that comes down to what Redford argues, it's what's the contextual level. What do you pay attention to? Do you pay attention that it's 24 pieces or do you pay attention that you distribute the, 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 the whole amount into equally sized parts? And that I, I would say, okay, the, 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 the if you pay attention to it in the right way, the action is the same, I would say. But, but that's the point. If you put yes. the attention in a particular way, yes. but I distribute my attention probably differently when yeah. I talk about chopping a bar than distributing a group of objects. For us, it's the same. Yeah, it might be interesting. So it might be a, like a, an interview with students where you have like uh, redo this task with a more diagnostic uh, interest where you really ask students, okay, what do you see? What do you pay attention to? Then you might see something about it. I, I cannot really say what the students paid attention to. We, we assumed they would pay attention to the, the distributing into equally sized parts, mm. no matter whether it, the, the whole is one whole or 24 stones. Thanks for the questions and thank you very much for the presentation. I personally have more questions. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, for after. Uh, yeah, to talk. Everybody yeah. is uh, yeah. invited to approach you yeah. more. Thank yeah. you so much. And we have a teeny small memorable oh. present. Oh, thank you so much. Utrecht. Thank you. Yeah.